I'm going to introduce our esteemed author here, Todd Peppers, who describes himself as an enigma. <laughs> just to me, was raised in Omaha, Nebraska, fellow Midwesterner. He's a graduate of Washington and Lee, and also the University of Virginia Law School, and Emory University with a PhD in political science. His two major areas of research and writing are the Supreme Court history and the death penalty. He is co-author of two other books on this subject, Anatomy of an Execution, The Life and Death of Douglas Christopher Thomas, which is the story of the second to last juvenile offender executed in Virginia, and the book A Courageous Fool, Marie Deans and Her Struggle Against the Death Penalty. And so he's here tonight to talk with us about his latest book, Crossing the River Styx, I'm going to raise it up, The Memoir of a Death Row Chaplain. Let's give Todd, a warm welcome. <clears throat> Thank you so much. You're on a sabbatical year and you're here with us. As normally, I don't get out of bed to about three in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Catherine's persuasive. <laughs> so tell us, I, I'm so sorry that Russ was not able no. to join us. And he, we moved this talk from November to February in hopes that he would, um, but his health was not, not well. So I'm hoping he'll, he'll join us like streaming viewers to see us talk about, and maybe better to talk about somebody who has done such heroic things when they're not with us here. But, but tell us, I mean, I can't imagine, tell us your, how you first met Russ. So first of all, I, I spoke with Russ about 15 minutes before I came in tonight, and he does apologize for not being here. Stress can do a number on a body, and when you watch 28 people die, that's a lot of stress. Russ had open heart surgery toward the end of last year and is still having some related issues. So I, I wish he could have been here because, in a sense, this is a book that's appropriate for Valentine's Day because I think of it as a love letter. And it's a love letter to a man who uh, is my hero, who's, who's Russ Ford. I am a dilettante when it comes to uh, research and writing on the death penalty. I'm probably an example of a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. <laughs> this all happened by accident. In 2004, in my second year teaching at Roanoke College, I was doing a seminar on the death penalty. And I tried to bring in folks who had been involved in all aspects of capital punishment, prosecutors, defense attorneys, the mother of a murder victim. And one of the women I brought in is a woman named Laura Anderson. She lives about 20 minutes from here. And Laura had been a spiritual advisor to someone named Chris Thomas, who was executed in January of 2000. He is considered to be the second to last juvenile offender because he was 17 when he committed the offense and 26 when he was killed. Laura had been Chris's junior high school teacher. And then when Chris had moved back home, Laura got in the seminary. Flash forward, Chris uh, killed um, his girlfriend's parents. They were going to break them up. Laura became a spiritual advisor and was the last person to touch him when he was still alive after they put him down the gurney and put in the IV. She was able to kiss him goodbye. She came to one of my classes. She talked about this experience and she, uh, we went to dinner and she said, I have a problem. She said, one of the last things I promised Chris was that I'd tell a story and I can't, I'm too close to it. So we wrote a book. In writing the book about Chris Thomas, and Chris's story is an example of everything that can go wrong in a death penalty case. I met a woman named Marie Deans, who um, was a death penalty activist in Virginia. Uh, she was sort of the best friend of the men on the row. She attended about 24 executions. And most of those executions, she was there with Russ Ford. Uh, Marie was dying. I helped her with a student write her book. And then I turned to Russ Ford in this book. So, but for a nail, but for a speaker in one of my classes, um, I wouldn't have gotten to know the ghastly history of the Virginia and the death penalty. Mm -hmm. So that's what brings me here today. Yeah. And so talk a little bit about um, Russ and his what time was he serving as a chaplain yeah. on death row and where? 
So um, Russ first served at a, a prison that no longer exists. I don't know how many of you remember the old Virginia State Penitentiary in downtown Richmond, a hulking, crumbling dinosaur of a place. Uh, Russ joined uh, the staff as a chaplain at the Virginia State Pen in the late 1970s, and he was an assistant to a really remarkable woman who deserves her own book. There's just not enough information about her. Her name was Marge Bailey. She was the chaplain at the Virginia State Pen in the late 1970s. She was the first woman in Virginia to be ordained a minister in the Southern Baptist Church, third woman in the entire United States. And she was a force of nature, and Russ worked with her. Russ then was transferred, worked in some other prisons, and then Marge um, developed cancer. And Russ returned to the Virginia State Pen, became the head chaplain there, and by extension, you become basically the chaplain for death row. Uh, at one point, when we didn't have a lot of people on death row, death row was in the basement of the old Virginia State Pen. But then in the 1980s, when we started prosecuting people with glee, uh, the size of death row exploded and it had to be moved um, to Mecklenburg, which also doesn't exist. So Russ was basically the head chaplain from the early 80s to the mid 1990s. And during that time, he was in the death house for 28 executions and uh, it took its toll. Uh, in December of 1996, Russ attended four executions of three weeks. That's how fast Virginia was killing people. And that was basically it. He attended one more execution in 1997, but there's only so much you know, a human being can take. So Russ started the Virginia State Pen. Basically, it ended at the Greensville Correction Center in Jarrett, Virginia, where the death row was until we ended it two years ago. And uh, part of this book is just not about the death penalty, but the ghastly things that happened at the Virginia State Penitentiary, a violent prison, oftentimes you know, barely under control. And some of the early stories in the books are sort of, uh, so Claire, you read to page 67, right? Okay, so there's a reason why I don't blame you. I mean, some of the stories about medical care in prison, violence in prison, as I said to Claire, this is not a beach read, um, and it's, it's a hard book to, Russ still suffers from PTSD. And we sort of had a shorthand when we were working on the book, which Russ would tell me you're blowing on the embers too hard, which meant we had to stick, take a step back. Um, because no one involved in the death penalty, and this is what I think, I wish people who support the death penalty would understand, no one who's involved in it gets away unscarred whether it's the ministers, whether it's the guards, whether it's the attorneys, the families of the condemned, the families of the victims. This is just like throwing a pebble in the pond and the rings don't stop expanding. And Russ was one of those people who will bear the scars of it for the rest of his life. That was a very long answer. It was a great answer, and I agree. It's, it's, it's a hard book to read. It's not something light to yeah. take in, but I think important. Um, Talk a little bit about the conditions of, I, I love the word they used was the wall yeah, well, for yeah, the yeah, enrichment. So, yeah, this so is, the, it was nicknamed, the pen was nicknamed the wall um, because of a, a, one gigantic wall that ran one side. Um, barbaric, you know. It, ironically, death row in Virginia, it was the inmates in the 80s and 90s who were running the show and keeping violence down. In death row, they were growing marijuana plants in their cells. They were brewing wine. There was one inmate uh, who was called the Dean of Death Row, Willie Lloyd Turner, who had a loaded handgun. When he was executed, he left a note behind saying, check my typewriter. They checked his typewriter. He had a gun in it with bullets. And then what did the Department of Corrections do? They tried to blame his lawyer, saying that the lawyer put it in there to make the Department of Corrections look bad. So my friend Marie Deans, who was this activist, worked with the men of the row. And she told them that she would only work with them if they behaved themselves. And there were a couple men in particular that Marie relied on. And one of them is a friend of mine named Joe Giratano. Joe um, came within 24 hours of being executed for a crime that I don't think he committed, um, that he received a, a reduction in his sentence from death to life because of concerns of factual innocence. That was in 1991. He didn't walk out of prison to 2017. 
But Marie would depend on inmates like Joe Geritano to stop the sexual assaults and stop the violence that the guards themselves couldn't stop. So we have a death row, and Virginia is proud to uh, remind you that we're the only state in the history of the modern death penalty that's had a mass jailbreak from death row. That happened, I think, in 84. Um, the inmates were running the asylum and in some ways doing a better job than the guards. Um, I mean, that's through the looking glass kind of stuff. Um, so this was a very strange world that Russ stepped into. Yeah. I think in the book you talk about how the inmates had the locks because the locks didn't work. Yeah, at, the, at the pen, yeah. So they had their own padlocks padlocks to mm -hmm. keep themselves safe by being inside. Yeah, and you can imagine what would happen if there was a fire, right? right. Yeah, right. you know, but they're all monsters, so why should we care? Right. And then we talk about, you know, cruel and unusual mm -hmm. punishment. I wonder if you would, I, I know we're, some of us are eating. So okay. um, Henry Owen Tucker. Yes. So just that, a little bit about. That short chapter is sort of as an example. And unfortunately, it's, uh, there's many other examples of the really substandard medical care that we provided inmates, just not then, but there's problems now. And he was an inmate who was basically over-medicated by another inmate, which would resulted in sort of the calcification of his joints. He became rigid, he couldn't bend. And then it got to the point where they didn't take him out of the prison until he had bed sores the size of dinner plates. And the Department of Corrections didn't do anything about this until Russ leaked the story to the press. And uh, we ultimately paid him some sort of pittance for his, for his injuries. But yeah, the, I, I think that a lot of times the attitude in Virginia's prisons is, it's just not the loss of freedom that's the punishment, it's also the conditions of confinement. And again, if you think someone has forfeited their rights to you know, basic human rights, it's not gonna bother you if you know, they, they don't receive good medical care, they don't receive nutritious food, that you know, they're not protected. You know, we, take every, we take away their ability to protect themselves and then when they get sexually assaulted, and develop hosts of different diseases, we just sort of turn away. And so those are the early chapters, but you know, the Virginia State Pen had prostitution rings running out of it, had a counterfeiting ring. There was an inmate who tried hand gliding out of the prison. Um, and the irony is you know, that the, the state prison dates back to what? Thomas Jefferson, who really wanted to come up with a more humane way to deal with inmates. Because oftentimes we didn't have jails or prisons, so you, you killed them. And so this grand experiment went so wrong over, over the centuries. And uh, when you see that historical marker in downtown Richmond telling you this is where the old Virginia State pen was, it doesn't really tell the story. No, that's why it's the light that you're shining on this. So the pen, the wall is no longer. No, no, it's uh, is it an industrial park. I keep looking at you because you keep nodding like you know you've been there. It, yeah, I mean, Marge Bailey, um, as an historian, you sometimes beat your head against the wall because things no longer exist. Marge was an only child. Um, there were no brothers and sisters. She was never married, no children. And when Marge passed, her personal papers were given to a family friend who subsequently passed and they're gone. And Marge, you know, she would march through that Virginia State pen, right? by herself. And um, I, I think that she's a remarkable character. Drove, I think, a bright red or bright orange convertible Mustang. Everyone knew when Marge showed up. The, uh, but this, she was a mentor to Russ also. Marge, for those old timers, you maybe remember the Briley brothers out of Richmond, um, a band of brothers who cut a terrible swath of violence across Virginia and then escaped in the death row escape and freaked out everyone again. Marge was at those two executions. She was a spiritual advisor. And Marge's backup was a minister in Richmond named Odie Brown. I don't know if you ever met Odie. Oh, no. Odie was a and Odie, how he cut his teeth, he was there for the Martinsville Seven. When he executed seven black men in two days in 1957 or something. Yeah, and he's another figure who, I, I can't imagine going through these experiences. What does it take? I mean, I think about Marge mm -hmm. 
as a woman on on this ministering to death row inmates what does it take you 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 quoted or victor frankel um you know what it is to give light must endure burning and he almost did yeah. at that first opening scene so, so a flippant answer and then a real answer yeah. it doesn't take much in the old days because when the virginia state pen was in downtown richmond when they brought back the death penalty and when death row was in i think a building the basement if you showed up at the main gates and showed you a card that you were a minister you could go down and prophesize to the men and so there were a lot of local guys who i think wanted just the rest called them bible notchers he just wanted to go back and say that they had preached to the to the to the condemned. In terms of what does it take, I don't know. I don't I don't know how you do it. I don't know. I mean, some people came to this accidentally. You know, when Russ his first stint at the prison was just sort of a part time stint. He wanted to he come over from the Hanover Correction Center and wanted to work with youth. I've met Helen Prejean a couple of times. I've asked her. I don't know the answer, what it takes. For Russ, I think ultimately there was no one else to do the work and he couldn't walk away from the men. Um, Russ had a, a crisis, a spiritual crisis during his ministry. It was triggered by ministering to a gentleman named Bert Klaza, who had sodomized, raped, murdered a young girl, 12 year old girl. Russ's daughter was the same age. And Russ really, really struggled about why am I here? Why should I work with someone like this? What can I possibly say to them? The problem is, is I'm going to paraphrase or garble this badly. There's a passage in To Kill a Mockingbird where um, one of the neighbors is trying to explain to Scout what her father does and basically says there's people in this world, good people, who have to take care of our messes who have to do what the rest of us don't want to do. And Russ Ford was one of those, was one of those individuals um, where he was going into the vortex of, of hell and because no one else would do it. That's why the book was written is but Russ wants to be a guide. He wants to be a guide to a world that no longer exists here in Virginia, but exists elsewhere. And he wants to pull back the curtain and show you the what our social policies, um, the consequences of the social policies. And it's also sort of a book that's sort of a never again book. When they got ready to take down the Virginia State pen, my friend Marie argued that the, the death house should stand just like Auschwitz still stands because she believed that powerfully that how wrong killing was. And this is sort of like that. This is a book saying, OK, we don't have in Virginia. We probably won't again. Knock on wood. Hopefully. But if you're thinking about it, read this book. And Russ is going to take you through these different circles of hell and show you what happens when we're involved in killing our own citizens. Now, Russ is not a bleeding heart. There are people in these stories who should never walk free again. And this may sound simple, but I think Russ's attitude was, why do we kill to show that killing is wrong? You know, it's simple and complex at the same time. And, and some of the men in these stories are men who should not have been killed. Russ's first execution was of a gentleman named Morris Mason. Morris was so profoundly handicapped that he literally could not understand the concept of his own death. When they asked Morris what he wanted to be dressed in for his funeral, he said, I'm a big boy, I can dress myself. He was schizophrenic and he was, he was mentally handicapped. He had no understanding of the consequences of punishment, why he was being punished. And the Supreme Court has held you cannot execute incompetent people who don't understand why they're being executed. That was Russ's first execution on his own. And Russ still has flashbacks of that execution because Morris, he told, he told Russ, tell the boys in the row I'm going to beat them in basketball when I get back. And so that's one of the, the really profound experiences for us. And, and so why, when there's eight clergymen gathering and petitioning to the governor and holding media, why, why was that kind of a person not given clemency? Well, ultimately, you have, have a governor who has, you know, who believes in, the clemen and believes in clemency and believes it should be meted out. Oftentimes you don't have that. These are politicians, right? Tough on crime. 
I think that the law has changed. I think we have a more appreciate, a greater appreciation now of the impact of mental illness. Uh, you know, Virginia, unfortunately, there's so many Supreme Court cases that has the name Virginia in it, Loving versus Virginia. There's another case called Atkins versus Virginia because Virginia was insisting on our God-given right to execute the mentally handicapped gentleman whose IQ was 70. And the Supreme Court, actually was 69, the Supreme Court said you can't execute it if it's 70 or over, unless it's 70 or over. Then they retested him and all the stimulation of the court case, his IQ went up a point and then Virginia tried to kill him. But I, I do think over time, the first book we wrote about Chris Thomas, who was 17 when he committed his offense, about five years later, the Supreme Court held it was unconstitutional to execute individuals who were minors at the time of their offense. Well, Chris lies in a grave out in Middlesex County. It's too late for him. So I do think things have changed, but Morris Mason committed a series of terrible, brutal crimes. And it's hard to get past that. And one thing we tried to do in the book is we tried to talk about every victim of every man, which is surprisingly hard. And there's a people say that we forget the victims. And there's an odd way that we were reminded of that. We tried to get photographs of every victim, as well as every inmate. And we couldn't find a lot of the pictures because newspapers don't publish them. We forget about the victims. So we had to reach out to family members. And if you want to talk about a strange phone call that could be met with either hostility um, or um, shock, calling up and saying, your grandmother was murdered by Ricky Boggs. We want to talk about Ricky's case. We want to talk about your grandmother. I can't find a picture of her. Will you give me one? Yeah. Can't no, <laughs> your stomach hurts. Yeah. The, um, but so, so the preface of the book talks about the execution of Ricky Boggs. And that's where Russ was almost killed. The execution was delayed. Ricky was in the electric chair. The mask was over his face. There was a delay. The death chamber was crowded. You couldn't see from one end to the other. Russ asked permission to go over and comfort Ricky. The warden gave it to him. The assistant warden didn't see Russ moving toward Ricky and threw the switch. And Russ came within about four feet of having 2,200 volts. Ricky had killed a woman, a grandmother, who he had known his entire life. When I reached out to the granddaughter, at first she was furious and then curious. And she ultimately ended up having an hour-long phone call with Russ about Ricky and her grandmother's death. And it was remarkably cathartic. Now, not all the phone calls went that way. I can imagine. No. No, but um, I can be persistent. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. That I think the photos really added too as I was reading yeah. it, and you would just kind of see the people and their faces, and it it really did do something. The the fifteen, you, it's over fifteen stories of mm -hmm. of inmates. It's also a story of the executioner, yep. which yep. is in there, and you and, botched executions and. The Dave, monster. David Eagert over there, Washington Lee <laughs> faculty, and I teach with a professor who was at a botched execution in Virginia, Wilbert Evans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the executions, running 2,200 volts through someone is not an exact science. I, I think yeah. that what I was struck with is how Russ approached each person in a different way from a Christian tradition, sometimes from using... Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist, yeah. or a poem, or even a mythic poem about a little mouse nice. that becomes an eagle. Yeah. And I know this is a hard question for you, but maybe in your experience with Russ, is how did he choose the stories that would actually open up that person? I think, he'd, I think he just tried to meet them where they were. You know, so Russ was also um, baptized, baptized, ordained in the Southern Baptist Church. I think that he, when he first started the row, he would consider himself a traditional Baptist minister. But very, very quickly, the, his arsenal of tools. And you're right, you know, if the men wanted to talk about the Miami Dolphins, he'd talk about the Miami Dolphins. If they wanted to talk about Buddha or Christ or Moses, they wanted to, it, he, he would meet them where they were. And he did not have an agenda. Well, I'll take that back. The agenda he had was he wanted those men to be as alive as possible when they sat in the chair. A lot of chaplains, because they are a paid state employee, has become an extension of this machinery. And their job is to make sure those men are compliant and sedate and meekly go to their deaths. 
And Russ's phrase was, don't let them take your heart. Until the very last moment, be alive. And while Russ would certainly work with the men about accepting responsibility, if that's where they wanted to go, he was not insisting that there was one answer to all the issues facing him. When you talk about the the jailhouse salvation, mm -hmm. and he had some that he talked about yeah. that didn't find peace. Mm -mm. You know, you mentioned photographs. There's a photograph in the book. It's one of my favorites because something happened in the processing of the photo, and there's a little bit of a special effect that shouldn't be there. Inmate named Michael Marnell Smith, and he's coming out of court carrying his Bible. And in a high, a high definition image, if you look at it, it looks like there's a glow around him. Well, Michael Marnell Smith was one of these Bible thumpers who sort of viewed religion as a magic spell. If he said that enough times it was true, Michael wanted to be executed holding his Bible, the Bible in the photograph. And the Department of Corrections said, we can't do that because the Bible might catch on fire. We're not worried about Michael catching on fire, and some of the men did. But the Bible, that's one step, you know, that's one bridge too far. Um, there were men who wanted to be executed without their masks on so they could stare at their executioners. The Department of Corrections said, we can't do that. There was one man who wanted his execution in Virginia televised because he said, if you truly believe that the death penalty deters, then let's televise it. We let's not do it, you know, at night behind closed doors. And oh, no, no, we can't do that. That's just, you know, that's too much. This is why it's going through the looking glass, you know, you know, the you know, men on suicide watch in the death house so they don't kill themselves before we kill them. In Virginia, do you know what happens? You can't answer, you can't answer this question because you probably know you're a ringer. Do you know what happens? It costs about $10,000 after we kill someone. The body is transported to Richmond where the Richmond medical examiner cuts it open and weighs organs and look at stomach contents to try to figure out what killed them. <laughs> so we protect ourselves from lawsuits and the, what they're, the box they check is homicide, right? You know, it is killing. But we, we do that before the family gets the body back. We autopsy the body to, to protect our the pec text from lawsuits. Now, your tax dollars at work. But it kind of leads us back to that unexpected love mm -hmm. that I encountered, you know, as hard as the book was to read and to hear those stories. Mm -hmm. But that, I mean, the, the, the person, I think, Alton Way, Alton Way is who, baptism. one of the first ones who Russ describes as a very nasty man. Mm -hmm. And yet this is the one who first says, God bless you, Reverend Ford. I love you. And talk about him a little bit and how he took the chair differently yeah. than other. So Alton Way was someone that shortly before he was executed, Russ had the op. Did you know Alton? Alton Way? He was there probably when you were there. Okay. Russ got to baptize him. And it had an ast astonishing sort of transformation. The guards took Russ aside and said, he's, he's glowing. And... <laughs> We have some video, we have some audio tapes of Alton in the last couple hours making up spirituals and singing them all to the tune of the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> but this gets to an interesting point, which is you all re remember two years ago in Texas, Texas had to have the United States Supreme Court tell them to cut out the shit of not letting pastors pray in the, in the death chamber. Texas wanted to stop pastors from saying prayers. Virginia, in many ways, fought chaplains. Bishop Walter Sullivan, Catholic Diocese in Richmond. Um, Department of Corrections accused him of trying to bring in contraband because he had his nitroglycerin tablets with him. Another minister was, not, was denied the right to bring the host in, saying, well, well, chaplain, we got Wonder Bread here. That should be you know, just as good. Um, Teresa Lewis. Teresa Lewis is the only uh, woman in the modern death penalty who was executed in Virginia also intellectually disabled, got pulled into a murder for hire scheme. They had to smuggle her out of her cell where she was held to baptize her secretly in the middle of the night because the Department of Corrections wasn't gonna allow her to be baptized. So you, know, you see all these people who wanna go in and every obstacle is thrown in their way. You know, and in, in, in sacred moments in the last hours of people's lives, 
they're trying to mess with them. And uh, again, what does that say? Is anyone here going to argue against letting someone have a final prayer? Are we that sort of harsh as people? But these people who were going in were, uh, were being messed with. That's the only way to describe it. I'm sorry, that wasn't your question, and I went on a tangent. <laughs> That's okay. You were okay. Led, led down a tangent oh, Okay, there. no, 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 you didn't lead me down a tangent. <laughs> but it, my question was, you know, really, what was different about Alton Way and how he how he approached the chair and what his last words were. I kind of highlighted them in my book because it, it was. And it, it, I'm trying to remember, cause I'm going to screw it up, which one it was who walked into the death house, Willie Leroy Jones and kissed the chair before he got into it. Yeah, there's amazing moments of grace in the death house. Um, there's moments uh, of love. There's, there, there's moments of, transportation a transformation not everyone the um we write i asked russ if we could write a chapter about someone he thought was beyond redemption yeah. and this is uh, andrew shabrol a navy officer who killed an enlisted woman who rebuffed his sexual advances and the crime the kidnapping was just absolutely absolutely horrific and um in the final hours of his life he was still bragging about what he was doing and Russ says, you know, he doesn't know necessarily he believes in demons, but this was the closest he fell to demonic force. This guy was so twisted that um, six months before his death, he wrote Arlington National Cemetery and said, if I die, I'm a Navy man, I want to be buried at Arlington. And they interred his ashes at Arlington. And through the work of a couple of um, politicians in D.C. and uh, the murder victim's husband, his ashes were recently is the phrase disinterred and removed from Arlington. They had to change the federal law to do it. Um, so Russ did not get through to everyone. Not every inmate on the row wanted to talk with Russ. Some inmates, you know, knew that Russ saw through them. Virginia's, unfortunately, for a long time, Virginia's most famous death row inmate was a man named Roger Coleman. He was on the cover of Time magazine. He claimed innocence. Everyone believed he was innocent until 10 years after his death when they tested his DNA and he was not innocent, killed his former sister-in-law down in Grundy. He avoided Russ because he knew Russ saw through it. So some of these guys hid. Yeah. Well, we're going to open it up. And that's part of what we do here for conversation in this community, questions um, from capital punishment to where this we is, are This now. is the most terrifying moment of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> I teach 18 year olds when I tell them, ask me when I have questions, my blood runs cold. Right here, yeah. yeah. Virginia is the only state in the country. Our state constitution forbids us from spending money on chaplains. So there's an organization called Chaplain Service, and it's a, there's a new name now I can't remember. And for most of its existence, it did rely upon donations by Protestant churches. Um, at some point, that changed, and now I think they get a percentage of vending machine or concession sales in prisons. Oh, really? But certainly this was not enough to for anyone to make a real living wage, right? And salaries were horrible. Yeah, you, you, you weren't making seven figures. The, uh, Especially the interns. Yeah. You know, Russ had a church also on the side where he made enough money to, to live off of, they, which is another, you know, sort of galling thing is that we want these people to go into the vortex, but we don't even pay them a living wage to to do this. Were any of the the men being executed offered a chance of heaven, heaven. Yeah. by Ru by Russ? Sure, if they wanted to go there, if he wanted to talk about John three sixteen, John he would do it. He would be more of a traditional minister. He just viewed you know, but he had Jewish inmates. He I think he uh, I think he presided over a Jewish wedding with a huppa. Um, in the death house, not the death house, but the death row. So yes, whatever those men wanted, and maybe sometimes Rush, Russ would uh, push them in one direction or another to think about these issues. But at the end of the day, he did not view his job of he had to bring everyone to Christ um, because some of the men didn't want that. And he, he viewed that as being an imposition of, but sure, there were men who, uh, 
there was there was one man, some of the men seemed almost frantic and trying on and discarding different religions, like clothes, Russ, you know, would say, and uh, trying to find one that would click, would fit. But yeah. Back there. Why did he view bringing them to Christ as an imposition? And that may have been inarticulate. If you were Jewish and you tell me you're Jewish and you want to be Jewish, he would view it as an imposition to come to your cell and talk about the good news. He didn't view that as his, as his role. Some ministers do, he didn't. Um, instead, he'd go back and he'd read up on Judaism and be able to talk with you about that or Eastern philosophy. Um, a lot of the men were into Buddha. Uh, so what he did was, you tell me what you need, what you want, what you want help with, and I'll provide it. So I, I think imposition is the wrong word, but he certainly didn't think it was his place. If the men didn't want to hear a certain message, he wasn't going to force it. Instead, he would help them with prison conditions. He'd help them get phone calls with loved ones. He would, you know. So yeah, that's the answer. He wasn't yeah. afraid to confront the prisoners and not just give them what they wanted. He would push them sometimes um, to try to confront uncomfortable truths. Yep. You know, he wasn't going to sit there and listen to Andrew Shabrol talk about raping a dead body. He was going to walk away from that. Um, and yeah, he, he, again, I think this goes back to he wanted the men to be fully alive. He did think, and I think acceptance of responsibility cuts across all religions, that he did want these men to confront what they did and appreciate how many people they hurt and try to find the grace within to, um, I mean, to be empathetic didn't work with all the men. That seemed an important part of his ministry, which was digging within the person mm -hmm. to pull out. And he felt they had to do the work. Yes. Yeah. It, it wasn't him. <laughs> yeah. And he'd buy them books. And, uh, you know, it's, it, again, it's, it's funny, all the different barriers the Virginia prisons put up. I don't know if you knew Father Jim Griffith, um, Catholic priest out of uh, Richmond. He got suspended because he brought an inmate a Janis Joplin CD or tape. Um, you know, I don't think we appreciate how isolated these men were by design. Because if you cut people off from every type of human contact, there was a gentleman on Virginia's death row who wanted to see a seven-year-old daughter one last time. And they said, sure, but your daughter has to have a cavity search first. Yeah. And how difficult was it to walk that, I, I think Marge talks about a tightrope mm -hmm. of dealing with the administration, mm -hmm. dealing with public, and trying to continue a relationship. That's an incredibly difficult space. Yeah. And there were a lot of people who do this type of work who get blowback from the public. Why aren't you waste? You know, why are you wasting your time on these animals? Why don't you minister to good people? Why don't you help out people who haven't committed these terrible crimes? My friend Marie called it another turn of the screw in terms of how you take away everything from someone and then you keep going. Russ was in the death house with a guy named Greg Beavers who had gotten married when he was on death row. And shortly before his execution, Greg looked down at his hand and said, oh my God, I still have my wedding ring on. I don't want to die with this on. And he took the wedding ring off and he passed it to Russ through the bars. And the head of the Department of Corrections was there and stopped him and said, we're not running a Boy Scout camp. Put the ring back on. Now, again, it's not institutional security. It's not coddling an inmate to say, I don't want my wife to have a piece of metal that was on me when I was killed. It's that lack of compassion. And again, some of these are real bad men who should never see the light of day. But the lack of compassion, trying to continue to stick in the knife and turn it. And we have some of those stories in here as well now. There's a story we tell about a guy named Mickey Davidson. He took a crowbar and killed his wife and her two daughters. Shortly before his execution, he managed to buy a funeral plot next to them, and he's now spending all of eternity next to them. We try not, we're not trying to, you know, hide the evil here as well. And we, we decided on that from the very beginning. 
Can you talk, yeah. you know, de more detail about that ripple effect of how it not only affects the executed, but the people there, the people working, the families. So the basement of the death house in the old Virginia State Pen was concrete. And they had a generator that you'd turn on to electrocute. And that generator would make a thunk and a vibration. My friend Marie lived in an apartment in Richmond that had an air conditioner that clicked on in a similar way. And she'd have a panic attack when she heard the thunk and the click. There is a, uh, there's a gentleman we talk about in the book, but I, I don't want to read the book, you'll see his name, who I've tried for years to find. He was the head of the execution squad and it was killing him. And he came uh, to Russ and Marie and said, I can't do this anymore, I'm gonna quit. And they knew that if he quit, because it was just, he couldn't sleep and I was hurting him. They knew if he was quit, he quit, he'd be replaced by a guard who was particularly brutal. So a death penalty activist talked the head of the execution team out of quitting his job, even though she firmly was opposed to the death penalty, because at least she wanted someone there who wasn't going to be messing with the men toward, you know, toward the end. You t some of these family members I called for the photographs, I sort of felt like I needed to do so a couple, I'm not being flippant, my background, I felt like I needed to do a couple Hail Marys after I called them because I activated pain that had been dormant for a long time. I talked to the son. His father was a jewelry store owner who was shot by uh, Willie Lloyd Turner. The son was shocked to hear from me. The son was working as an intern at the hospital when they brought his dead father's body in. And he said, if you ever come to my jewelry store, I still have the bullet hole in the wall where you fired the warning shot to keep it, you know, keep it, remind me of my father. And, you know, I'm talking to him 40 years after the murder happened. So that type of, you know, because I never talked to anyone who said the death penalty brought me peace. Inevitably, when uh, the family members of murder victims talk about their experiences, they say it wasn't enough. My loved one died in a brutal way. They died in a peaceful way. It wasn't enough. So what is enough? If someone's raped and murdered, do we rape the inmate before we murder them? No one is ever satisfied. I think the word closure should not be used in these circumstances. The prison guards are traumatized. The chaplains are traumatized. The nurses who are there helping with the process are traumatized. And then we don't help any of these folks. We don't provide resources, mental health counseling, et cetera. We should. Did, did Russ talk about forgiveness in any of these complicated aspects? That's a good question. A have you read Dead Man Walking? Yeah, Helen Prejean says the biggest mistake she made was she didn't re realize, she didn't, she never reached out to the victims' families. Because um, I think, it, you know, th that's one avenue where you could talk about forgiveness, because with the inmates, I guess you could say forgive the state for trying to kill you, but forgiveness may be a, a harder from that perspective. Russ never really interacted with the, the victims' families. If for no other reason, he was too busy. In 1998, we had 88 people on Virginia's death row. And again, we were setting them up and knocking them down, sort of shooting, like shooting, I'll say pop cans since we're from the Midwest, like shooting pop cans off a fence post. And so his every waking moment um, was spent with them. But that's a good question. I'll have to ask Russ that. Um, I mean, certainly these men, we talk about some of these men who the, the skids were greased in utero. Men whose mothers were abusing drugs and alcohol when they were pregnant, who came into these situations where all they knew and, until they ended up in the row was an unbroken string of physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, engaged, you know, in a, sort of a picture book example of juvenile delinquency. And I think Russ talked with the men about trying to f forgive the environment in which you were raised. The um, Earl Washington Jr., who came within eight days of being executed for a crime he did not commit, he was in the death house without an attorney, and the attorney general's office in Virginia wasn't bothered by that. Now, one time Earl was uh, doing chores and he wasn't moving fast enough, moving firewood, so his uncle shot him. You know, <laughs> these are the environments, you know, 
there's the old saying, those that have the capital who don't get the punishment. There are no rich people on death row. None of these guys came from stable two-parent households and went to good schools. And you know, it's, it's dysfunction um, again and again and again. Doesn't excuse what they did, but if you've ever taken a class in criminology and juvenile delinquency, the stories about some of these men, it almost seems like we're making it up because we're hitting every single red flag you see in classes like that. So what do you hope um, that a reader would experience and why, why put this book out there? Well, I started off by saying Russ Ford's my hero. And one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book, which is not why Russ wanted to write the book, is I think we need to celebrate people like Russ Ford. And there are a lot of Russ Fords out there. Joseph Engel um, is down in Tennessee. He's been off and on the chaplain of Tennessee's death row since the early 1980s. And he's in his late 70s now. So Russ Ford is not unique because there are other Russ Fords out there. But I do think we need to acknowledge, you know, everyone watched the Super Bowl. How many times did you see Taylor Swift? Nothing wrong with Taylor Swift, but we're in a culture that worships celebrity and superficiality and money. And then there are people like Russ. There are people like Joe Engelden in Tennessee. There are people like Helen Prejean, who at age 86 is still crisscrossing the country trying to stop executions. So one, I want to tell their stories, and two, to make sure we don't go down this path again. Virginia, we think, executed about 1,400 men, women, and children since colonial times. No other state has executed more. Um, we have an insurmountable lead, no matter how hard Texas tries to catch us. Um, we have a really bloody legacy in what Justice Harry Blackman called the machinery of death. And I like to think this book in some small way might keep some folks who might be predisposed to support going back to the death penalty might make them think twice. Because you know what? It deters nobody. We say we have the death penalty because people won't kill if they know they could be killed. There's no empirical data for that. Studies show that it costs between one to $1.5 million more to charge them with capital murder go through trials, appeals, and execute than it does just to try them life without parole and then lock them up for the rest of their lives. So you know what? We can't buy crayons for school children. We can't repair our highways, but we're willing to spend that much more money on executing people. I get people in my face who cite Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Exodus. There's 27 death penalty offenses there, including talking back to your parents and having sex outside of marriage. People aren't too keen about those death penalty offenses. <laughs> But, you know, then my students and I tangle with the Sermon on the Mount. It's awfully hard to reconcile the teachings in the New Testament with strapping someone down, putting a mask on their face, and then letting them gag for seven minutes, which happened in Alabama two weeks ago when they had their first execution with nitrogen gas. I just can't reconcile that with the New Testament. So between 1908 and 1962, my number is going to be a little off. We executed, I think, 246 people, all of them except one male, the majority black. And of the black individuals, many of them were put to death for rape or attempted rape, which means they had the temerity to get out of their lane and perhaps show attention to someone who was white. I mean, you, you look at the pictures. The Library of Virginia has a picture of every single person executed between 1908 in 1962, and it's blackface after blackface after blackface. Studies show that if you're a black man and kills a white victim in America, you're 18 times more likely to get the death penalty than if you're a white defendant who kills a black victim. We just value white life more. So the racism that permeates the entire system as well. About 40% of the modern death row in America is African American, but yet African Americans make up 8% of the population. It doesn't take a lot to see what's, you know, what's going on. I, again, I think that message of what you're trying to communicate and the stories that are illuminated here, we don't hear, we don't walk those places. So thank you for doing that. Thank Russ for being a part of that. And can I also and mention- I want to hear you about your third author, author here. The third author is my oldest child. <laughs> 
Charles was going to Grinnell College in Iowa when the pandemic hit. And Grinnell decided to go online for a year and about a quarter. And so Charles, like many students, had their college experience disrupted and they came home to mom and dad. Russ and I were struggling. This book is formatted in chronological order. That's not the original structure of the book. We blew up the book and started reformatting it and we were stuck. Charles had been going with me to death penalty conferences since they were 12 years old. You know, you have to be careful, your children listening. Charles was with me when Joe Geritano walked out of prison after, you know, almost 40 years in prison for a crime I don't think he committed. And Charles helped us across the finish line. Charles is a remarkable researcher, um, a lot of deep dives into newspaper archives. Um, and so Charles pulled us across the finish line. And uh, so that's why my kiddo's name is also in the book, because the book wouldn't have been finished without, without Charles. And now I'm forcing my youngest son to go over to William & Mary with me because I'm working on a biography and the papers are over there. So now I'm trying to brainwash my other kid as well. So. <laughs> and the next book is? The next book is very different. Um, it's on Warren Berger. Warren Berger, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, left all of his personal papers to William & Mary. One million documents, 4,000 photographs, 400 audiovisual, and they're sealed. They are, uh, presidents don't own their papers, justices do, which is odd. And so he gave them to William & Mary with the caveat that they would let a biographer in. And so Buddy and I are the biographers. We have into December 1st, 2033, Papers open up 10 years after the death of Sandra Day O'Connor, who was the last justice to serve with Berger. So yeah, so now I'm forcing my youngest son to go through Warren Berger's personal papers. So <laughs> Keep it a family affair. Yeah, that's, that's right. For All right, well, let's, let's give Todd a warm round. Thank you so much.